distant road makes its way along the Knives Run, passing between cultivated fields. At this time of the year, some of the fields have dense green plants, covered with beans or peas. The wheat and oats are ready for planting. Very few plots lay fallow, unplowed and unplanted, with only a tangle of weeds growing on them. Commoners are hard at work in the fields. You see two or three men plowing with big tawny oxen. One leads the animal and the others follow behind, manipulating the plow and burying seeds carried in a cloth soldier bag. Elsewhere, chopping out weeds and picking off bugs, you see women with their heads wrapped in patterned scarves, carrying woven baskets on their backs and flanked by children. They rarely seem to notice you, but when they do, they look up nervous as if caught by those in charge for not working. Then they quickly drop their eyes and go back to work. You heard rumors of the Iron Lady that have been obliged to put down uprising that were fermented by slanderous rumors that the Langmires work their serfs expecting long hours in the fields. Thin golden grasses mark the lands. Yellow golden rod is scattered here and there grasses. Every so often you find a bunch of purple flowers. Overhead, flat-bottomed, fluffy white clouds follow on, one after another like a herd of wayward sheep. The clouds cast their shadows across the fields below as they progress over the fields in a slow parade. Small wagons and carts of local farmers and traders pass heading towards the center of trade that is the village of Ederbok. From all four compasses, most let you pass without a word, eyeing the wagon and your group curiously. The well-traveled road you are on swings closer to Neb and into a dense cluster of shingled buildings that comprise of the breadbasket of Ederbok. From the west, another well-worn trade route that seems to disappear into the horizon towards Veluna. From the east, over the Neb, Another road disappears into the horizon of farm fields. The road to the south travel along the Nive into the Kron Hills that disappear into a horizon of rich green that is the gnarly forest. Presiding over the lands of men is the magnificent Lort Mill Mountains with its frosted peaks. This small town of 300 is nestled in a small valley along the banks of the Nive's run. It gets its name from the great number of ettercaps which plague the hills between here and Nold, and are a constant menace to travelers along the high road. Standing guard over the first buildings is a signpost with the Langmire livery and the words, Village of Ederbok. The buildings of Ederbok are a mix of single and two stories with several more prominent that rise over the rest. Amidst the gathering buildings are people coming and going from shops, homes, the center of tr town, which seems to be the marketplace. As you enter the village, the people pay less attention than the serfs in the fields as they go about their business. At each end of the town is a magnificent manor with the largest flying, the livery of Langemeyer, dominating the center of town over the marketplace. Another across the street bordering the stalls is the Cathedral of Worship. You have a sense of a thriving, hard-working trade center. Hello, I am David of the Three Orcs Channel. Today I'm going to cover one of the villages of the Verberbach area called Ederbok. It's a small village just south of the city of Verberbach along the high road. It's typically the road that adventurers would take um, if they traveled from the city of Verberbach to the village of Hamlet and further south. It's also the um, city of Verberbach is typically the, the starting place of my Temple of Elemental Evil campaign. Um, I'd like to start them off there to give them a firm grasp of what uh, the Viscounty is like, and of the politics, the nobles, and, and, and merchants, and different organizations in the area that could have something to do or with ties to the Temple of Elemental Evil. Um, there's a lot going on in this campaign, as I mentioned in my previous videos. I, I like to say that I, ba I basically took the Temple of Elemental Evil module, and I combined it with more of a along the lines of the Game of Thrones, where I added the politics of the region to explain and to understand 
how the temple itself does not exist in a vacuum that outside influences are sending supplies and slaves to the temple to, to so for them to grow behind the scenes and I feel that if I start the players off at the major at the main city that they'll get a feel for the land and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll give the they'll give the campaign a more broader scope um, it'll become more engaging for them rather than just a simple dungeon dive which can get boring so um, today I'm covering my village of Ederbuk and we're looking at the village um, of the high road coming from Verbebank on this map, which travels south along the Knives Run. Um, I figured the, uh, this far north, the river is a couple hundred feet wide, uh, just enough for fishing boats to get down and small merchant craft, flat bottomed barges, um, and, and the road l runs along with it. And I, and I, and, I'm, and the road starts on the east side of the river in the city of Verbevanc. And then it's gonna cross as you go south, a, a bridge to get into the village itself. So on the map, um, we have a windmill across the river. Um, I have 57 or more locations that I, that I marked on the map, but they're not all fully keyed, but a lot of them are. Um, I like to keep it open just in case it's needed for the campaign. You pass a small little farm. Uh, and, and it's a good place for the adventurers to like possibly meet or um, exchange some dialogue with a local, a farmer or family or his children, run to the fence to see the heroes go by. Um, obviously they see merchants travel daily from Verba Bank to this, to this village up and down this road. And, and the locals would, would be used to seeing uh, merchant caravans back and forth and the caravan guards but usually players are very very much more exotic. They have much more sophisticated and expensive armor and gear weapons. Um, and so it's generally they stand out, especially if they're different races and classes. And so that would draw the attention, especially to the children. And you can have the children react any way you want. Either be fun or in awe or ask questions or follow them or whatever role playing comes to mind. But, and then possibly maybe the mother will call to them um, usually you'll see the workers out in the field working, making sure there's no trouble being caused. So you go further south, and then you come across a larger farm uh, with a pasture of um, cows and some more farm fields, and you go further to the crossroads. So at the crossroads, you can continue, you can continue south, which will lead you to another farm, or you can travel east to Penwick, which is at the center of the Bike County. Uh, or you can cross the bridge into the village itself. If you go south, I figured that maybe 54 could be uh, a trade station, carriage house, uh, maybe even a tavern. And 55 would be, could be an inn. Um, it's up to you, but I didn't key it because it does have a, a farmhouse there. I'm sorry, it does have a barn to, for horses and carriages. And it has a large yard. So you travel farther south, and that road leads you to a couple small farms. Another farm of 59, and 60 is a fishing cottage. Um, he has a fishing boat. It's usually a small family or a fisherman, and he makes his living on the river. And then you go into the f a local forest. Maybe there's edder caps down in, in that area, but not too close to the village, of course. So we go back up to the crossroads, and we'll cross. Um, at the crossroads, at the bridge, of course, you see the docks. So that's the main merchant docks. Um, river traffic that comes south along the river will stop here at the docks for trade. Um, unload cargo. And uh, I, I guess number two would be a trade house, a uh, warehouse or something like that. Exchange. Um, also, the tax collector will probably be there. Um, so that way the village makes sure they get their taxes. And... Uh, I have a lot of this keyed, I'll show you in my article. Uh, number four is a large church that um, I believe I described in my intro. And um, the, the, the number one is the local marketplace with all the stalls. Um, I, I flagstoned the marketplace and then it kind of disappears. The flagstones disappear as you go down the streets. I put a, I put a couple water wells there in, in, for public use. 
Um, we have a fountain in the middle of the marketplace, and then to the west we have a, a caravan water well for travelers. Uh, if you go south, um, you got more village, a village area where you have more shops and buildings and homes. We got another fisherman, number 38. And we have a stream running through, a minor stream that would not be in any map. Um, this would be a large ranch farm to the south. And then the dirt road that keeps going south would be applied to other farms uh, along the river there. So if we go back to the village proper and we go left to the west, you see the main road um, continuing west will lead you to the village of Mole. Um, if we go north, we see that it's just more farm fields. And um, trails that re lead off the map will go to other farm fields, deeper into the territory. So we have a lot of farm here, farms. And then south, uh, the road that traveled to that large ranch area, uh, I, didn't, I didn't scroll farther enough south, but that road continues along the night down to Sinega Valley and then to Village of Hamlet. So that's the main high road there. Uh, and it has a windmill too. So I try to put together a medieval village that would have all its functional. Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at the Edderbrock itself. So as I mentioned before in the intro, um, it's a small town of 300 people nestled in a small valley along the Nye Run. Um, it gets its name from the Edder Caps. If you plague the area up and down the high road, that's a constant menace. Um, I, I would expect that the local authorities, the guards, and the amount of borderers would have their hands full trying to keep the high road clear. But I would, I'd expect that Edder Cops are smart enough not to get, not to prey on travelers on the high road, but they would actually prey on out in the wilds, away from the main road and the river, to where um, they can get away with their activities of their prey. So, uh, so basically the town originally was owned by a minor noble. His name is Winston Juggalus. I get a lot of these names from uh, fantasynamegenerator.com. Um, I also use a couple other websites I'll link below to help me create NPCs and shops in towns. Uh, I, I use them to sketch me an idea and I kind of pull them together and make my changes to fit the town. Uh, so he's beholden to House Langmar, uh, he, but he almost never leaves his villa on the Nye, except when summoned by the Viscount himself. Uh, he leaves the everyday affairs of the town to his daughter, Paloma. She's well loved by the townsfolk for her kindness and genuine concern for their welfare, but she can often be found visiting the sick or injured. Unfortunately, uh, she doesn't have a lot of pull or he does in this town because um, these lands are owned by House Langmar. The township suffers from the demands of Lord Lodovic Langmeyer to produce to produce for the house. But there there has been slander that's reached even the ears of the peasants and the tenants that farm the lands. Uh, both the Baron Baroness Goladiva have been obliged to put down the uprising that were fermented by these slanderous rumors. She been she has been labeled the Iron Lady, no doubt to a testament of her strength of will and decisive nature. The current voice of slander seems to be coming from those of the Church of Trithrun, who seem to feel it is their duty to tarnish the reputation of anyone that has money or it is, that is profitable. Um, I actually start this all off in the city of Rivervok at the, at the Cathedral of Trithrun. I use, I, I'll, I'll have this parade, um, and the high priest himself will come out and make a speech and ferment possible rebellion among the locals of the Viscounty to rise up against the nobles. And it's always a thorn in the Viscount's side and the nobles to deal with him. But um, as you know from the history of Verbebach, uh, they're a highly favored church within Verbebach and they have this deep history. In fact, they did save Verbebach several hundred years ago against the last um, invasion of the Great Kingdom. And you can look at that video later. Uh, so the members here are House Langmeyer, a small parcel of land situated right in the heartland of the Viscounty, befitting the status of such noble and regal house. Um, if you serve the house, you're expected to be well, 
you're you are expected to put the well-being of that house before all the other interests. Uh, this is based off the uh, Living Greyhawk uh, tournament modules, where you create, have a character that's online, and um, you can be members of different households, or or members of different organizations in the Greyhawk world. And a regulator are people are the regulators serve House Langemeyer. They're the like the strong arm, the law of the house. You don't want to. They don't want to. Dis, you don't want to end up disappointing Baron Ladvik or Baroness Goladeva. So let's go ahead and start from uh, the first manor here. So let's go ahead and review most of the locations here in the village. Uh, so number one on the map itself shows that uh, this is the marketplace. The village marketplace is across the bridge along the high road. I have a description uh, for the characters when they first arrive. You wander through the streets of Vetterbook and come across the market, which is located in a disorganized series of large tents. It seems that the vendors are organized by the social class in which the vendor caters. The market is known for having either absolute trash or total bargains, and it's rather dirty. In the center is a large weathered stone statue of a man rearing a magnificent horse or horse branding a lance. A bronze plate embedded in the base reads, Dithorus Langemeyer, Vice Royalty of Thurand. To the side of the statue is a double post notice board with newer posts nailed over the much older notices. And I created one actually. So these are different uh, rumors around town, quests that the players can go on to, to get a reward. Um, this, most of this is aimed at uh, a low level campaign. Uh, first to third level characters. Uh, but all, a lot of this can connect further on in the campaign to the Temple of Elemental Evil activities. Uh, so I got a little picture um, of what the marketplace looks like. Um, then there's stalls. Um, I have six uh, example stalls here to use if players decide to browse the, the aisles and see what they can find. Um, I have some dialogue. Tasty meat pies baked in the shape of otters. Delicious. Be the envy of your friends. Things like that. Uh, so this is give it some character. So if we go back to the map here, um, we'll go to location number two, which is over at the at the pier. Location number two doesn't have an entry. Location number two is a central hive of activity of river traffic, of merchant traffic coming and going up and down the river. Um, they use it as an unloading area and a taxation center um, to uh, unload and load uh, merchandise from the village onto the river. So the next location will be number three, which is at the foot of the bridge. That location is called, I called it the Cathedral of the Damned Men. Um, this is the town's cathedral. The villagers pray to several lawful good deities, um, lawful gods that are approved by the house Langemeyer. That's their supporters although this temple was not originally dedicated to these gods. Uh, Torbera Bayerger, a priest of Rao himself, um, I have a description of his character. He presides here uh, with several other priests of lawful good deities. Uh, most of them consist of the Church of St. Cuthbert, of course. It's, um, it's known for its famous sculpture and is guarded by nothing. The temple welcomes all. The temple also has classrooms. Uh, it's a modest rectangle. So I have a description here of what the building looks like in a little picture. So we'll move on from there. So after number three, uh, four would be located. Location number four is not key either. This is a perfect, um, this would be a perfect church for another god, for another deity. Um, I would think that it would be, I haven't got a, I have not got around to thinking about what which deity I want to be here um, in this village because we have the main central worship worship chapel for all the for many of the other awful gods. I figure that whatever deity is worshipped here at this largest building would be grandly supported by the House Langemeyer. And it's something I haven't really put a lot of thought into until just now. I just realized I didn't key it. So I need to pick a god for that. So if anybody has any recommendations of the perfect god for that household to be strong supporters of besides Rayo, 
Um, give me some suggestions below. But as, now that I think about it, it probably should be Rayo. So maybe um, the priest of Rayo from number three should go to number four. Number four will be a church of Rayo. And number three will be all the other gods. A really good idea. But if you have any thoughts, leave that below. The next one's number five. Um, that looks to me like an inn. So if you wanted to actually place another inn uh, with more NPCs in this village, that'd be the perfect location because I left it blank. The next location will be number six. So if you scroll up on the north side of town, is this large guard tower. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, this two-story solid stone structure built like a fortress proudly displays the large house Langemeyer pendants from the top of the walls. Small windows. It's got a good description of, um, of a guard tower here. This 24-minute arms. Um, the constable's name is David Bush. Uh, he's lawful neutral. And then we got some stats. So it's very useful to, uh, for the players. If they have to interact with the guards of the town, you can get the information from here. After number six to the west is uh, the Langmire Manor itself. That's number seven. As you can see, it's a large estate with its own barn and uh, other buildings and a well. So let's go ahead and look at that. Number seven. So Langmire, Langmire Manor um, has a great description of what the outside looks like. Um, I have a temporary map right now, a Zill Manor I'm using for now until I can make another one. It's a placeholder. And uh, inside there's a large dining hall paneled in rich dark woods. A brief description. Um, I don't have plans for the players to actually enter this location at this time until later on in the campaign, if they ever do. So this is more of a placeholder until preparation until that does happen. But this is the family manor where they live. All right, number eight's next. I'm um, just south of there. Okay, so let's go down to number eight, which is Jugulus Family Manor. And I see that uh, the lands of the town belong to a minor noble, Winston Jugulus. I mentioned him previously in the history of this village. Um, this is his manor. Um, I don't have a lot of description here because I don't have any plans for the players to interact with him yet. But when they do, this is ready to be expanded. So after the next location will be just south again on number nine. Number nine is Jadawin's Lodge. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, I see that uh, we got a placeholder for what the building may look like, but this is the home of the Sidawan family. Uh, this comfortable two-story stone inn is bustling with merchants and traders and caravan guards and locals. Um, I have a description of what the inn looks like. Um, we have a description of Julian. Julian. He looks amused but seems pleased with the welcome distraction from Patreons, who he tells you are the most part of his trustworthy lot. Julian pours himself a drink while you talk with the thick man about the regular goings-on in Verba Book. Um, he has some dialogue here, and he, pay, he charges a gold piece per day per person to stay there. Warm beds and meals and food, takes care of the animals. We got a couple specialty drinks that I put in here off of uh, the top, off of a website that lists 100 things. Uh, so I got that, and then we have a notice board as well. And uh, two things I listed on there the, for starter quest. A seeds to any quest that they might want to get themselves into around the local area. Somebody's missing a pet. Um, there's some rumors, and I also added some rumors like giant rats. Um, somebody stole a horse. A bard died mysteriously. So that's all here. Um, I also have um, local NPCs. Roge is here, Dolphia Herd, and Eldad. Uh, they're just NPCs that were randomly generated that I added here in case the NPCs happen to stay here and they start to mingle with other NPCs at the inn. And it, these could have their own story siege or they can join the party as potential henchmen. Okay, after that, at the other side of the village, number 10, is a merchant house by the docks. Let's take a look at that. Morrow's. Morrow Merchant House. 
Um, I have a placeholder picture, the general idea of what the house looks like. I have a description of what it looks like when you go there and when you step inside. Uh, it's a cramped wooden building, dangerously messy. The shopkeeper is sitting, mug in hand. The shopkeeper nods at you, drags his feet over to you, introduces himself. It's got a name. Um, so that's ready to go in case the players happen to go in there they want to sell or trade or buy things. The next location is number 11 right in front. It's that square little building right there with a sign out front. Um, number 11 is the Watchtower. Um, from the Merchant Road, the Viscounty travelers and merchants from the wares, soldiers, commoners, and others moving in and out of the village. You can smell bread, seasoned meat, sweet wine as you walk around the Watchtower. Many more smells and sights assault your senses as various merchants carry their goods into the village. The whole area is such confusion that you can't imagine the guards even keeping track of who enters and who leaves. And by the looks of them, they're not even trying. Uh, they are well equipped in case of a disturbance. Each guard wears chain armor, steel helm, tabard displaying House Langemeyer, and carries a longsword. You notice that the guards on top of the Watts Tower are dressed the same, and each has a longbow and quiver of arrows hanging on their backs. The people entering the village form a line that moves slowly over the bridge or at the gate. They wave a few people in without comment. These seem to be locals as they are on foot and most are alone. The wagons and groups arriving from afar receive more attention and the people are often alert, alertly questioned. In one case, the guards look into a covered goods in a wagon. Two guards poke while the driver stands a few feet away next to a third guard, wringing his hands. He looks quite nervous, yet they pass him into the village without any further incident. The guards seem aware of people coming out of the village, but they do not seem to question any of them, nor stopping anyone from leaving. So this is just a little bit of description I added to bring the, the village to life when the party gets there. All right, after, after number 11 is Gold Manor. Um, he, is the, he is the senior tenant officer of the manor. So let's go find that on the map, on the map, which is next to the guard tower and uh, mark uh, and next to the and next to the docks next to the guard tower and next to the docks um, this is large banner right here let's scroll up a little bit and let's go ahead and take a look at number 12. let's see what we got here um, it describes him who he serves um, it tells you a little bit about what a villain is and what his duties are to the village i have a description of the house and what it looks like from outside um, it's possible the players might go there and question him about the work ethics of the farmers out in the fields, find out what's up. It depends what the party's doing of how interested they are, but this is enough information here to get them there and look around. Then you'll have to role play from there. Um, all these articles I can always add to later, you know, expand them even more if I feel like it's gonna be needed. Okay, so back at the map after 12, we have a whole bunch of, um, shops that ring the marketplace itself not all of them are keyed so you can generate many more shops for this village and put them there all around the marketplace um, we have 13 which is a gambling house um, it's a tavern but i wrote up a description of what it looks like what the tavern looks like from inside and outside and there's heavy gambling in there so let's go ahead and find that on the map and that's number 13. It's right, in, right next to the guard tower and, and in front of the number 12. So it's right there uh, in the center of things. Or, um, the, I would expect that a lot of the guards go there to gamble as well. Or the, if they didn't, then they probably shut the place down. Um, so we have more buildings. We have a smith. We have a chapel. We have a, a bakery, a trinket shop. A house of Grapes is basically a tavern that offers a wine from all over. Um, from Celine all the way from Valuna, Ferrandi, Greyhawk, and of course Sienega Valley to the south, the, the next village south. Um, we have a graveyard, number 58. So I have a whole entire description here ready to go, and an NBC, a caretaker. His name is Peter Astley. Um, a description of him, his history, um, his relationship to Tobura Berger over at the Cathedral of the Damned. And we'll look, find that on the map, which, which is across the bridge and to the south. It's on the way, on the road to Penwick. We'll 
graveyard here of the statue. And uh, that covers most of the keyed areas. Um, you're welcome, anybody and myself, of course, can key more as needed. Um, I felt like if I over created the map, um, it could be much more useful later. So let's go ahead and talk about House Langemeyer now. So this is their lands. Uh, there's seven noble houses of Urbavank, and uh, they're one of the major ruling members of the Council of Lords. Okay, so I'll look at them. Uh, so Lodovic Langemeyer is the nominal head of the House of Langemeyer and its small parcel of lands right to the Viscounty's heartland. Uh, the real power resides with uh, his mother, the Iron Lady, Godliva Langemeyer, for whom the phrase comes from too mean to die was coined, along with other darker whispers, but no sensible person pays them any heed. Uh, he's in his late 30s. He's still unmarried, partly because his mother considers most candidates beneath him, partly because he enjoys using marriage prospects as a political ploy, but mostly because the eligible noble ladies shudder at the prospect of him marrying into that family. Uh, rumors of Lodovic's alliance with one of the maids ended in a poor, the poor lass's tragic fall down the stairs. It's best not to discuss implications to such an inappropriate and scandalous topic any further. Um, this is all noble speak um, when it comes to gossip among the nobles. Uh, so anyway, C is currently tantalizing factions in Voluna and with prospects of alliance, which makes her less than popular in many of the Verbabunks circles. Still, House Langemeyer puts on a public face of support for the Viscount Wilfric and pays his taxes to the Viscounty in full and on time, which allows Godaliva a great deal of lat latitude in her actions. Uh, Godaliva is playing a dangerous game with objectives unclear to any but her, but she may still be shrewd enough to pull it off. Lord Lodovic heads the household, but rumor says he's a mere puppet to his mother, the ancient Iron Lady. Also, only the highest ranking members of the Verbabunk nobility are permitted to have heralds clear their road for them. That's just a little comment there. So they have background and goals, a whole history of, of the household itself, and then who the members of the household is. Um, um, over here, I got some NPCs that I created for the for the that have different that play different parts in different parts of my campaign. They come from different Living Greyhawk modules, and a couple like a lot of these NPCs I create from scratch because of the need for them. Um, the territories they control. So, so that's the House um, Langmire, which I created the Herald for. Um, we'll go ahead and look at Lodovic real quick. So that's Lodovic right there. Um, he's paunchy, balding. They have all description of him. His background, a lot, much of the same information. His relationships with, with who, uh, you know, his stats on the right. So he's ready to go here with his own account, with his own article, and his mother. And his mother here, and his mother, God Oliva. Um, more description of her. Um, so he's got secret political plans, which only I can see. Only NP the DM can see that section. The, the players in the campaign can only see the top half. And, uh, and so this is a good example of what's going on in the campaign with um, the cult of elemental evil. Um, there, even if you don't have a, a dungeon crawl, a, a massive dungeon to go to with all these evil cults rising up and causing problems in the area. If you're just got this, even in the medieval days, you got all these nobles and they're always got these ploys for power and greed and, and, and things that are up to and jealousy and greed. And, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be connected to the temple of elemental evil for them to do things or to have their own secret plans. It's up to, it's up to the players to sort this all out. Um, and, and to do it justice, I do have all the nobles up to something, but what, who they're connected to, nobody knows until they find out. So the players are trying to figure things out by um, working for different nobles and you know, going on missions and doing errands for them and reporting to them and getting help from different nobles. And they're trying to figure out who to trust and who not to trust. 
Um, also, as you can imagine, you know, you become favor you become favored with one noble, and then other nobles will automatically hate you so if you choose a side. You know, my enemy is my enemy, and uh, or or they can pretend to be your friend, but they'll stab you in the back later. So they could be tied to the Temple of Elemental Evil, or they, or may, they might not, or they might unknowingly be tied to the Temple of Elemental Evil. You won't know until you actually play it in the campaign. And so it's up to the DM to figure all that out and piece it all together. And I guess, you know, a DM can have a lot of this planned out and some of it can be done on the fly, depending how the campaign goes. So that basically uh, shows everything about Edderbulk. Um, I created this map myself using um, Wonder Draft. I created Edderbach and Wonder Draft using many objects from artists from Patreon. Um, I'm allowed to uh, share this map to others. I just can't put it behind a paywall. Um, but I am allowed to share this freely with the people. Uh, so you're welcome to download it and use it in your campaign, no problem. I numbered all the locations on the map so you can key it to your liking. Did you enjoy this video? Maybe consider tossing some support to my Patreon since it's the best way to support the channel. I look forward to making more videos of the different villages of Urbabank. And I hope you find this information and these maps useful to your campaigns. Happy gaming and I'll see you next time.